Are you like slapping each other's butts with like rolled up towels, throwing alligators at your dicks? Like, is that is that a whole like good time? I'm like, I'm like Jose, quit looking, turn around. That's what that's what it is basically. I like to think that there's actually a guy on your team named Jose. Yeah, I was I was in his wedding. <laughs> I finally watched. 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 Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of I Finally Watched. This is David. And this is Alon. And I finally watched any given Sunday. I keep calling this film Taking Back Sunday, but that's a band. Well, they say the movie quite a, say the name of the movie quite a few times. Um, Actually, they say it so many times. I was like, you could you could do a drinking game. I don't know. I think four shots. You're probably fine. Four. I counted five, four. Yeah. You counted four. Well, so there's I mean, one. The first one is like maybe the fastest I've ever heard the title of a movie said in the movie. Yeah. Without like I don't know, without it just being like purpose, you know, it's obviously purposeful. But, but the next, it... the next two are like pretty quick after that, and in succession. I don't remember that. I remember him saying it to Cameron Diaz, and then I remember him saying it at the end of the movie, and then when the movie ends, the song says "Any Given Sunday." Yeah. Um, never taking back. So I've seen this movie like thirty to fifty times. Jesus. I had the DVD. I watched it all the time. Uh. Probably just because, like, as like a a preteen teen, there's just a lot of like violence, boobies sexual. There's not that many boobies. There's a lot of dicks. There's too many dicks. That's <laughs> that's that's one thing I wanted to tell you is the ratio, the ratio from boobies to dick and men's butts. It's too. I I would not personally, you know, choose a movie with that kind of ratio. <laughs> There's a booby to dick ratio, and this one does not fit it for me, okay? Yeah, normally you want it to be, if you're going booby to dick, you want it to be a whole number and then bigger than one. Um, but this is a fraction, and that is unfortunate. Um, you know what's interesting about this movie is it follows a very similar script of other movies we've done, Friday Night Lights, uh, Varsity Blues. That's another thing I wanted to talk to you about, is that every football movie we've done, actually... Let's just say every football movie I've seen, which leads me to believe that every football movie in existence has something to do with the star quarterback or a variation of such getting hurt, dying or failing in some sort of way and having to be replaced by their second or in this case, their third. And I'm thinking, is there no other football movie to tell? Let's see in the replacements, which we'll do eventually. Um, the lead quarterback is uh, on strike. So Keanu Reeves comes in as a scab and leads the team to some victories starring yeah. Gene Hackman as the coach. <laughs> Gene Hackman as the quarterback. Uh, and then as, as Shane Gillis said, remember the Titans solved racism. So that's a story you can tell with football. Um, yeah. I mean, there's lots of stories that just happens to be these three that we've done the only three we've done on the the pod and therefore the only sports movies you've watched kind of did it a different way. Uh, I like that this movie just sort of gets right into it with like, uh, with the, there's, it's you mean the get first... right into it. Like the first 40 minutes is just one football game. N- well, no, the first play is the quarterback getting hurt. And the second play is the second string quarterback getting hurt in like rapid succession. And so this is also, my first um, Oliver Stone movie, one of the only ones. He, he's actually like a huge blind spot. So I've seen Platoon. I don't remember it that well. Yeah, same. But I haven't seen Born on the Fourth of July. I haven't seen JFK. Natural Born Killers. Yeah. So just a lot that I have like missed that I, I need to catch up on. I was looking through Oliver Stone's IMDb and I was thinking we should actually start doing his films. Well, it was a month, or are we going to spread them out? Because I don't know Spre- if I can... Spread them out. Spread yeah, them I don't out. know if I can handle that much. No, no, no. Okay. Spread them out. Oh, you know what? The other one I've seen is Savages. 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 Barely. And then I have seen the World Trade Center movie, but that's like a very un-Oliver Stone movie from what is I... That, what is that? Remember Me? Or is that with the one with Nick Cage? No, this movie's called World Trade Center. Oh. And yeah, it's with Nick Cage. 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, this is the one with Nick Cage. So, um, yeah, man, I, I gotta say, out of all the football movies we've done, it, it's a good movie, but probably my least favorite. Just because all the dicks, I get it. Um, no, 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 no. It is such a crazy, crazily edited movie. I, I read somewhere that there's like over 3,000 cuts in the movie. I believe it. I, if you... Yeah, I believe it. Like the sound design was actually really cool to me. I actually really liked it. Um, Taylor did not, but I did. I thought like every hit, you felt every hit, every fall, and it felt like rolling thunder. And I was just like, it's and there was actually thunder and lightning in them in the movie too. But um, but I really enjoyed that. But dude, the cuts and it would just like Al Pacino and Jamie Foxx are having a conversation, and it's just intercut with Ben Hur. And I'm just like, what the fuck is going on? Uh, He said he did that purposely because Charlton Heston was in the movie. Um, And then the other thing you have is like there was like lion sounds when some of the defensive linemen would like come up and pretend that they were going to, you know, I mean, that they were they were about to make you know make a hit. Um, The the sort of flashback like this movie is painting football players as gladiators, right? Because there's these flashbacks that you know, to like the golden age of football and then like, you know, in the stands and everything. And it, it does, you know, with the animal noises and all the the hitting, like the, the sound design, as you said, like it feels like, oh, these are modern day gladiators. Like that's kind of the point it's making. Because um, it, you know, it's funny, it reminds me of Gladiator. Gladiator came out after this. Um, and then the, the other thing is like the you know, this reminded me a lot too of NFL blitz. And I don't know when the original blitz came out, if it came out before this, but did you, you never played that game as a kid, right? I'd imagine. No, I had a, I had a life. Oh yeah. Yeah. You didn't play any video games. I you played so many more video games than me as a kid. I don't even have to ask. What, what I'm year? I'm, I'm curious what year would NFL blitz would have come out? Well, because I know there was an NFL Blitz 2000, but that leads me to believe that there was an NFL Blitz before that, right? So, um, I'm yeah, looking NFL, up now. Yeah, there's an NFL Blitz, and then there's NFL Blitz 2000. Oh, yeah, yeah. The first one was 97. But this, like, honestly felt almost inspired by that that game, right? Like the It's so funny. When you look it up, it says the release date, 1997. And then it says best version, NFL Blitz 2001. Yeah, well, yeah, because we used to play that all the time. I remember my fondest memory of NFL Blitz. I'm going to tell a fucking war story here about a video game. But my brother had the ball, and he just had to run the clock out. And in NFL Blitz, they had, like, the plays were just kind of crazy, and one of them was an all-out blitz. And I just did it, like, three or four plays in a row, and he couldn't get the ball off in time, and I sacked him, like, Four times in a row until it was for a safety to win. He just fucking threw the controller and was like, I'm not playing this anymore. <laughs> like, I got so mad about it. But, and that was that was 2001? Uh, I don't I can't remember which version we had. It was for the PlayStation, I think, actually. It was like PlayStation, oh, PlayStation 2. In 2001, Halo, the first Halo came out. I was playing that. I bet you were. Yeah. Um, you know, so this movie too, we talked about this before. It has so many fucking people in it, just like everywhere, Every, right? Obviously everywhere. it has the main people. You know, Jamie Foxx, I think this is honestly like a huge break for him, slash maybe just step up in his career at this point. Um, you know, uh our friend my friend Zach, who you, you're friends with too, his dad like always all the time would like steaming Willie Beeman, <laughs> like would just say it all the time. But you got him, Al Pacino, Cameron Diaz, um, even in like Eckhart. Yeah, but then in smaller roles like James Woods, Matthew Modine. Hello, Cool J. Yeah. Um, and then uh John C. McGinley, our boy. John C. McGinley, yep. In a great part. Um, and then the football players. So you have uh Bill Bellamy as the wide receiver. You have Terrell Owens, which is like one of the three best receivers ever, and kind of a like a sort of a hidden part. Because uh, Oliver Stone asked the NFL to use like their team names, and they said no, and then they threatened a lawsuit over the movie because they didn't like the way like that football was depicted in this. So are, and... the, are the Miami Sharks supposed to be the Miami Dolphins? No, it's actually purposely because at one point they mentioned the Miami Dolphins. 
Okay. So it is a um, it's it's like an offshoot league that's supposed to be kind of an amalgamation of like the USFL and like an. Is there uh, such thing as the Pantheon Cup? No, no, it's all made up. It's made up for lawsuit purposes. You know, it's funny too is that um, that uh, HBO show Ballers with the Rock. They actually just didn't have the NFL's permission, but used the real team names. Uh, sort of as like, basically they said it was fair use and no one had ever used it in quite that way. And they're like, well, sue us over it. And I don't think that they ever did. I think they, the NFL was like, we will probably lose. <laughs> or at least that's what, like my last recollection. I only watched the first season of Ballers. And I, I like how they were basically like, yeah, sue us for the name of a state and an animal, you fucking chumps. <laughs> well, I think they use more than that. Um, I think we can just get into it. You know, this is a two and a half hour movie that flies by. And also, you know, we're not going to fucking do play by play on the games. So because there's so much game time, it actually is, you know, less to talk about than there might be in like a two hour movie that doesn't have like 30 minute football scenes in it. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I kind of see us making half. Hey, we'll check the records at the end, but this is probably going to be like a 40, 45 minute episode. I don't know about that. I don't know why we don't have to, you don't have to gamble on it. So as we already said, so the, you know, cap played by Dennis Quaid goes down immediately. Oliver Stone, I guess, couldn't find anyone to be the announcer. So he's like, I, I'll do it. Oh, he was the announcer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Dennis Quaid is supposed to be playing a 38 year old um, cap um, with a smoking hot wife. Right. Am I right? You know where she's from? Um, oh, man. I recognize her when I watched her. I know Dumb the name Dumber? too. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, uh, she ended up being a bitch by the end of this movie. Um, yeah. She was kind of scared that she'd lose, lose her fortune. Dude, really I don't probably. blame her. Uh, that house, that house that supposedly is owned by Dennis Quaid's character is a nice house. It's Dan Marino's house. I don't know who that is. He's, I mean, he's not really what this character is based off, but he is one of the he's the greatest quarterback to never mm-hmm. win a Super Bowl. Um, and he was a uh, Miami Dolphins quarterback for many years. Oh, well, nice house, Dan Marino. Um, also, uh, the uh, the fact that Dennis Quaid is supposed to be 38, but he's 45. I was like, all right, I guess was he 45. Yeah. Yeah. He looks I mean, first of all. I'm now at the point in my life where I am older than all the people I'm watching play sports, which is yeah. not, you know, not the greatest. But yeah, 38 years old, when they're like, oh, he's 38 year olds. So I was like, could you get him the fuck off the field before he dies? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, um, so, yeah. So Cap gets hurt. <laughs> second string quarterbacks gets hurt. And then we're immediately Willie Beeman is put in Jamie Foxx. Um, and then this whole this kind of this whole part is just like setting up this movie is really just like a character study like a character arc of jamie fox but also sort of his rise and al pacino's on the down end of his career right and then like kind of how they have to meet and work together and it's well who who do you consider to be the main character of this movie it's pacino okay yeah we're we're on the same page I mean, I think you can make the argument for either of them for sure. But I mean, I think it's Pacino. He's probably got more screen time. Um, and he has I mean, more, the, more at stake, too. Yeah, but I mean, we see the love life of both of them a little bit. Like, so I don't know. I mean, you could go either way on that. Um, there's just a lot of also like funny shit in this movie. So, you know, we get to halftime and like 69, the offensive lineman, who I guess is. Patrick Madman Kelly. I never knew his name in this movie, but I think mm-hmm. that's him. Uh, having to take the shit with the IV. Him. Yeah. Yeah. Which yeah. is just like a hilarious little bit. And then <laughs> there's a lot of stuff in here that's a little bit ahead of its time for 1999. Like the movie is kind of having this commentary on the like the way black quarterbacks and black players are treated in the NFL. And, you know, Al Pacino, the first thing he says to Willie Beeman, he's like, just go out there like you're back in the hood and your mom is calling you home for dinner. And you're like, damn, that shit is fucking racist. And like later on, run to the Buick, run to the Buick. (laughs) I mean, 
it feels inspirational at the time. And then later on, Jamie Foxx is like, that bullshit you said to me, like that racist ass shit you said to me earlier about the hood and my mama calling me home for dinner. Um, and then like kind of the stuff where it, um, when Willie Beeman's kind of really feeling himself and then he's talking about like, it's, it's in this movie, it's sort of played for like, oh, he's full of himself, but he's bringing up points like, you know, there's no black owners. There's barely any, you know, no black GMs, barely any black coaches. And like, they don't really want black players to be quarterbacks, which is all like issues that kind of have been dealt with in the NFL. like since this movie came out. Um, but they also like this opening game sets up the fact that coach is on his way out. She's brought in this offensive coordinator Diaz, Cameron Diaz has to sort of take over. Um, and then this is something I picked on, picked up on more this time than any other. The offensive coordinator is uh, Aaron Eckhart, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. The play caller normally. Um, but LL Cool J's selfishness and the fact that like no one really likes him. <laughs> Like the offensive coordinator doesn't, the owner doesn't, the coach doesn't. They're all just like and, dealing with him. They're like he's a fucking mercenary that he's good, but like we need someone, you know, that is for the in team. Real, uh, in real life, did you know that Jamie Foxx and LL Cool J did not get along in this movie? I read that, yeah, that they actually got in a fight. Well, uh, Jamie Foxx was quoted, I think, as saying like LL Cool J took our like animosity a little too, you know, like, a little too to heart. Uh, in the movie where they get in the fist fight, L. Cool J actually punches Jamie Foxx. Yeah, makes sense. It looked real. There is that one point where um, L. Cool J gets like the... I don't remember how he got the fucking cut on his head. I don't know if they ever showed the play that caused that. <laughs> You're going to need plastic surgery. Let me see. Oof. Also, uh, this this movie has several pretty great speeches from Al Pacino, including obviously the one at the end. Yeah. But I love the one he's like, you act like a loser. You're going to act like a pussy. And L.O. Cool J reads his hand. He's like, what, what are you doing? And he's like, I just didn't want you to be the only pussy in the room, coach. Yeah, that was good. Also, um, my my favorite scene was with uh, Al Pacino, L.O. Cool J, Aaron Eckhart, who was on the right side. When they're in the locker and they're all talking, he was like, got to pass me the ball so I can make the mil- – so I can make the – Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh man, was it um was it James Woods? I don't remember. It was dude, James Woods, man. I love I for 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 his character or his like voice to always connect me with Hercules, like he's Hades from Hercules. I cannot ever think about when I hear his voice, I just think Hades from Hercules is talking. This this is like a perfect role for him. And like but at the same time, it doesn't give him enough time to like deliver the dialogue that he's so good at until like sort of his firing, right? Um, That's true. That's true. So they lose the game when uh, LL Cool J fumbles. By the way, we're about to do another LL Cool J movie after this. Also, are. both movies, sort. Well, I mean, in this movie, the song in the movie is sort of just of like the movie universe, really. Whereas... We're going to do Deep Blue Sea next, which I'm very excited for. Um, Deepest, bluest, my hat is like a shark's fin is made for the movie, but is also sort of made for the public. And I think uh, we all accepted it as, as great, obviously, at the time. Uh, Deepest, bluest. I was wondering how much how much of the music in this movie was either Jamie Foxx or LL Cool. LL Cool? You don't even, you're not even going to say the J, huh? Nah. So after this, it's a bunch of uh, sort of like little scenes after the game. Cap's really hurt. Willie at this point is like, ah, man, I'm just a, you know, I'm just the third string. I might not even get to play his, his arc to being an asshole. It's funny for how long the movie is. It's kind of like becomes, it comes very suddenly. Well, it's when he kind of dumps his girlfriend. He's on the. Oh, I want to talk about that part because I actually don't, I, I thought she overreacted a little bit, a little bit um well okay yeah i i it's not that she overreacted i thought that she didn't stand up for herself at all i don't know let's talk about when we get to it um but i want to bring up elizabeth berkeley being in this movie Who's from that saved by the bell and then uh showgirls elizabeth berkeley. oh she's the prostitute yeah this was during her i'm getting out of my saved by the bell era where she's like i gotta 
differentiate myself. I gotta show my boobies. She showed one. That's like so. There's two and a half. There's there's yeah. There's three boobs in the whole in the whole shebang. And you're, how many? You're talking about how they're all like snorting coke off of their boobs in the bathroom. Yeah, but there's only one. There's only one there. But then there's yeah, but lots the, of lots of peepees and butts, and that, male that, butts. And that one dude when Cameron Diaz walks in, this his holy one was- <laughs> shit. Holy shit. They're like, do you want to be naked for the movie? He's like, hell yeah, I'll be naked for the movie. Let everyone know what I'm working with. Yeah. Um, I'm like, it, see, here's the thing. Here's the thing. <laughs> I feel like that's how big you have to be to be okay with to be naked in a movie. Uh, I don't know. The guy from uh, Hangover, he seemed to have no shame. No. <laughs> I guess I mean like to play a small part. And in a movie, you know? <laughs> so, um, yeah, she hits on him. He at first thinks, oh, I'm just getting hit on by this woman. And she's like, it's a thousand. A thousand for a bang, five thousand for the night. And I'm like, lady, a man at his age, yeah, like five thousand for the night. He's only got one in him. Like, what do you, you know, what is, what's the rest of the night? Just to allow you to sleep at his nice place? Maybe he wants a cuddle partner. Yeah, you know what? If it's for the night, she should be paying him. It should be like should be a thousand for the night, five thousand for a bang. I remember when uh, the pretty woman uh, there was an argument about oh her hourly rate versus the and he's like well how about I give you this for the whole weekend and people are like dude you took so much less like your per hourly now has gone down and people were having to explain like well one she's sleeping and two like the safety of not being on the street and how many peepees she had to fiddle in order to make that amount. It's like people couldn't understand like that. He was just supposed to pay that hourly rate for the whole time she was there for, for this movie. No, for, for pretty woman. Oh, for pretty woman. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Hey, I got a question. So, you know, uh, Jimmy Fox is on uh, the gold digger song, right? Mm hmm. Okay. There's a lyric that says you'll see him on TV any given Sunday. Yeah. Is that in reference to this movie? Yes. Okay. Because that was six years afterwards. Because that came out in 2005. This is a pretty big movie for Jamie Foxx. Uh, okay. I thought you were going to quote a different lyric. I thought the podcast was about that. Wait, <laughs> nothing about a gold digger. Uh, yeah. Broke, broke. So he then broke. calls his ex-wife. And I guess apparently Jim Caviezel was supposed to be his son. And they had scenes and then they got cut. Um, Jim Caviezel is of... supposed to be Al Pacino's son. Yeah, oh, okay. there's going to be scenes that got cut, and this is, I guess, around the time. I don't. What is frequency? Frequency was 2000. So young Jim Caviezel would work. Um, after this, find out she's trying to move the team to LA um, or get a new stadium. So I don't know how that works. Um, I do like though how me not knowing anything about football, I immediately knew Cameron Diaz was the owner. Um, I thought they set that up pretty, pretty well, um, yeah, for, right, a, yeah. for a layman like me. Um, but I don't get how she's supposed to move an entire team to a different state. That happens all the time. Yeah, I think they take they take multiple buses. No, does it does it happen? It's like the Miami Dolphins are now the L.A. Dolphins, or do they have to completely change their name, or do they have to adopt the name of? How does it work? Uh, it can work multiple different ways. It's, uh, for example, like in basketball, you know the Utah Jazz. Have you heard of that team? No. Let's just say you have. So the Utah Jazz were originally from New Orleans. The New okay. Orleans Jazz makes a lot more sense because I don't know how much jazz there is in Utah. I'd imagine hey, how less. much jizz there is. Should have been called the Utah Jizzes. <laughs> you like that joke? No. Okay. Anyway. So, like, one, you could change the name for the new location. Obviously, you change the name of the, the town or the city. Um, and then you can change the team name if you want. And it's a process that, like, takes a while. So the Oakland Athletics are moving to Las Vegas. but They're actually playing their last season in Oakland right now. It's like a lame duck season where, like, people aren't going to the games because, like, fuck you for leaving. So it's like a process that takes a while. They set up a stadium in the new location. They set everything up, and then they go. Um, okay okay and but this is just like one she's like oh we'll go to la but really we're like wanting to leverage you know to get a new stadium here 
And then the other thing is like she's not doing it right because you need to get the the vote from the other owners. I imagine the mayor sold her out. She I imagine the mayor hard. sold her out. It does like it does make me kind of mad that she was like, oh, just two hundred fifty million dollar stadium, and he's like, no, we got we got schools and roads to build, and she's like, now nah, fuck that. I'm like, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's where our tax money goes is stupid sports games. Because it brings in so much money for the economy. And then in a lot of instances, like the teams don't own the land. They're leasing it. Yeah, the Native Americans really own the land. Well, not, not, not after Andrew Jackson was done with them. But no, I mean, they don't own the land. So it's like them paying all the money for the improvement. And like there's a give and take with it. Um, 200 and in florida specifically they actually have different dollars that they voted on that go to things like stadiums and like tourist stuff that so can't like, go to schools so like did something similar happen like with the mercedes-benz stadium in atlanta when that when they like uh yeah but that one wasn't contentious and i think arthur blank i think he put a good amount of his own money into that one Okay. But I mean, so the Los, the L.A. Rams were the St. Louis Rams and they left because they, you know, one, they just wanted to go to L.A. because they thought it'd be better for them. Um, so was it? I mean, I just won a Super Bowl a couple of years ago in okay. L.A. So, yeah, maybe I don't know that it had, they might have been able to win it from St. Louis. They won one previously. Let's get back to this. I don't need to teach you about football anymore. Okay. So um, then this is maybe my least favorite scene is Al Pacino comes over and Cameron Diaz has this conversation with him. I don't know if you noticed this, but it really bothered me this time. She says his name every sentence. Whose name? Tony? Yeah. Tony. Yeah, yeah. Tony? You're not, you're not, we're not in the 80s anymore, Tony. That we used to work. Then Tony. Tony, you need to, I was like, what the fuck second, is happening? Isn't that, isn't this the second or third movie where Al Pacino plays a character named Tony from an Oliver Stone flick? What's the other one? Scarface. Tony Montana. That's not a that's not an Oliver Stone movie. Is it not? Brian De Palma. Oh. Anyway, I thought the whole conversation was kind of stupid. Um, and then a lot of like expository stuff where they're talking about uh, Shark, who's played by Lawrence Taylor, who's like one of the best defensive players ever. Um, In real life? Yeah, in real life. Although oh. he had some charges later on. I don't know whatever happened with that. But I like how also, football. like with uh, with Varsity Blues, it's the same thing where uh, don't you can't you can't do one more, man. You can't do one more. You're gonna get a concussion. It's your fifth concussion on top of the concussion, and you might not you might not come out of this one alive. It's that whole fucking thing. Yeah, that's what you. Oh, you liked it. All right, that's all you had. Okay, good. So next game. Starts the second stringer again, who is playing horribly. Um, and Willie comes in, starts running his own plays, gets yelled at. Um, what's funny, there's this one part where Al Pacino says, what the hell is that? And then it cuts to the announcer saying, that's football. <laughs> yeah, I noticed that. I do like that Cameron Diaz is like, oh, okay, Willie is the ticket. Like he's the ticket out of here and Tony is old news, but she can't replace, you know, she can't but Willie is the coach, but then Aaron Eckhart seems to be behind her and, and whatever. Um, but I do like how she gets absolutely screwed in the end for all of this. Yeah. Yeah. We're not at the end yet. But well, no, but even before that, where, where, He's playing real bad. I got my invisible juice. Did you forget your invisible juice at home? What? Remember when he's in the interview? You have a stroke right now? No, no. When Jamie Foxx is in the interview with McGinn. Oh, he says got he's, invisible juice. He's got that yeah. invisible juice. And then he fucking plays horrible. And they're losing like by 10. And then all the players hate him because he's just talked shit about the defensive line. So LL cool. J turns to him. He goes, what happened? You forget your invisible juice at home. Yeah. And then that's when they fight. Um, 
Real quick, so back to we're at the party after the second game, which they win because Willie comes in. And uh, we got the mayor wants to meet Willie, gets in the fight with the girlfriend. And this is where the bathroom orgy happens. Uh, oh, I do like preemptive, like before that, where uh, Cameron Diaz is meeting, I think, with the mayor. And she's like, or he's like, uh, Ma- mighty back. fine. Mighty fine group you got there. Real role model for the kids. And I was like, it's going to cut to them doing something nefarious. And it surely it did. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the one guy's like getting blown in the bathroom. The other guy's doing coke off titties. <laughs> the guy, uh, Bill Bellamy in the in the bathroom stall is like, man, this one girl said my piece looked weird. That fucked me up. I should go to therapy over that. <laughs> um, And then, uh, yeah, so the bathroom orgy, the one line from... Uh, 69 again the lineman he's talking to the old lady she's like what do you do for dick and she's like oh <laughs> oh no uh, when uh when uh later on <laughs> later on when when willie goes into the bathroom following vanessa there's an old lady that he's like barbara bush i love you yeah love that was you. a good one she did look quite a bit like barbara bush um so then he gets in the fight with his girlfriend and this is where i'm like she's kind of getting mad at him and he's like he's like listen man I have so much shit going on right now. He's like, I, I'm now the starting quarterback. I don't know any of these plays. Like, I can't deal with you, like, getting mad at me because I talked with some people and danced with some people. Um, which is true. He probably should have been, you know, whatever. Um, but she gets super pissed. And he calls her a dyke. They get, and he's like, she's like, you know, I'm going to go over to my friends. Maybe she'll fuck better than you. You know, and then, you know, they're sort she, of over. She gave some real good insults, I got to say. Like, real good insults. Yeah, what else is she? She was in something else where she is like really good. Oh, uh, the big hit. She talks shit to Marky Wahlberg in that mm. one. She's pretty great in that too. There's um, yeah. Well, okay. So I don't think he did anything that wrong. Um, but she did overreact in that in that circumstance. The fact is, though, she felt like completely out um out of her league with the other caddy bitches, like the other caddy wives talking shit to her, like. Like that passive aggressive stuff, like, oh, uh, until you're a wife, yeah, or like, yeah, or oh man, I'm sure Taylor has like dealt with that before we got married, but where you're like, I've been with him for ten years, it doesn't count until you're a ri- with a ring on your finger, like that kind of shit. Probably from her mom. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Hi, Chris. Anyway, so. <laughs> 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 you're killing me like she listens yeah so next with the la game and he's calling his own plays um so there's this one part and this is like very like just like football love right here but he drops back throws a long bomb to i think bill bellamy and then the song breaks in do you want a revolution and it's just like the the backup singers going oh, 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 oh like that so yeah. fucking cool What's a bootleg? A bootleg is where you fake a handoff and then the quarterback sort of runs around and then like can throw it or can run it himself. Oh, okay. Yeah, that happened a couple times then, huh? That's a pretty big Willie Beeman play. Yeah, he's a fan <laughs> of that. Okay. But I think I think even uh at the end Cap did that too, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. The white quarterbacks can do it as well. Oh, wow. Okay. So, I I do I do like how there's only like maybe four four white guts on that team once cap is out that's that's the way it should be um so cameron diaz after the game comes in to speak to willie and he asks her out and this is where we see the the big dick to do it again um yeah i do like bunch of that. asses bunch of butts bunch of tiny penises in the background too did you notice that i wasn't looking that that closely Ah, uh, there were tiny penises in the background. And I, I don't know if they were tiny, like, in comparison to the body, but, like, in the background, out of focus, they look tiny. Um, <laughs> listen, if you're listening to this and you were one of the tiny penis background players in this movie, tweet at us. Beat me up. <laughs> like, it was um, actually, it was, it was cold in there, all right? Yeah, yeah. Tell us, tell cold. us. Um, it wasn't cold I, for that one guy. <laughs> one guy. Unless maybe, like, it was, and then just in real life, he's, like, fucking down to his knees uh no but so, so so um i like how she's like no i don't date players but it it i feel like it did play into the kind of the race thing where she's like i own you 
like you're my team i don't involve myself with you but like as my property you do of course she's white and they're all black so you could you could look look at that as as with as much metaphorical you know cheese as you want so you know that's all well and good that you want to talk about that but i want to talk about how did number 69 have an alligator to throw in the shower at an away game in la did he bring that on the team plane or did he just does he have an la alligator guy i was wondering that too i i was thinking i just I never up picked to... up on that until now but that's an away like if it's in miami it's like okay he brought his alligator he's a fucking crazy man but the, they were on a plane. Yeah. A private it's, jet. He could have brought an alligator. You can bring anything you want on a private jet. Yeah, I mean, imagine that's what happened, you know. So, But it's, it's still a little weird. Also, uh, way too small of a gator for those guys to be scared of it. I don't know, man. Their dicks were out. You know what I mean? Okay, that's that, yeah. That's true. Um, I, I, I never... Never was in a situation where I was in the shower with a bunch of guys who were butt ass naked with me. Uh, but it must one, be just it must be like a cultural thing with with sports. I'd do it once. It's not fun. It's not like it's not the best. Are you like slapping each other's butts with like rolled up towels, throwing alligators at your dicks? Like, is that is that a whole like good time? I'm, like, I'm like Jose. Quit looking. Turn around. That's what that's what it is basically. I like to think that there's actually a guy on your team named Jose. Yeah, I was, I was in his wedding. <laughs> <laughs> so then LL Cool J complains about his plays and how his millions. And then um, you have a lot like cats. Dennis Quaid plays such a fucking white guy, like an old white guy in this movie. Like it <laughs> is actually like so well written because like, like the, I feel like the younger black players are written written very well too, and it also feels like they were able to kind of give their own like slant to things, like with their dialogue. But you know, when uh, when Cap's like, he doesn't give a gee whiz about a dash garn thing, you know what I mean? Like gosh darn thing, you know what I mean? Like he sounds like fucking Opie, and I think it's really funny. And so he he gives advice to Willie. Oh, that's who it like was. This, that's who it was he, in that scene with LL Cool, Al Pacino, Aaron Eckhart, and Dennis Quaid. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad we solved it. Um, and then he, but he gives that advice to him, and then, uh, and then Willie like just tells him to go fuck himself, basically. Um, and then after this, Matt Modine tells James Woods like, "Hey, Shark needs an MRI," and he's like, well, "I'll do it. I've earned their trust," because he's trying to, you know, kind of hide it from them. But um, then he goes behind him and he shows him the MRI, the real results. But this is the part where they use basically a montage to kind of establish like the blown up ego of Willie Beeman, starting with the Steam and Willie Beeman music video, which is just great. Cringe. Oh, I was singing it to myself and Ash and the, in front of my wife, just like get the ladies screaming. screaming. And she's like, "What are you saying?" I was like, "Get the fans out. screaming." It's pretty good. Cringe. It was great. It was. He cringe. has the race with LL Cool J where he wins. Um, and then there's the scene with uh, Cameron Diaz where she, she's finding out that Shark could die on the next hit and that Cap is fine. And she's like, well, just tell Tony the opposite. Yeah. And what's even crazy about that, I love the line later on where, I, who is it? The mayor he turns around, closes the door behind him. And it's his aide or someone. He goes, I truly believe that that woman would he eat, would eat her own young? It was um, Charlton Heston. He's like the commissioner of the football league. So, oh, from Ben Hur. Okay, yeah, yep. And then he goes over to the coach's house for dinner, and uh, Shark told him to bring flowers. Coach gets pissed if you don't bring flowers. Um, I think he brings the flowers. He's like, "What the fuck?" And this dinner is a pretty cool little scene, like where. He, he just puts it out there like, you know, I'm starting cap for the playoffs. And he's like, you're not a leader. And then he gets really fucking pissed. At he's him. not he's, like, he's not wrong. He's not wrong about that. I mean, no one on the team really likes him. He didn't really set himself up to be the leader. He set himself up to be the star, you know. Well, they actually like him in the beginning, sort of. And then he like loses him, right? Because Shark likes him. And then he starts talking shit about the defense. The only one who doesn't like him in the beginning is LL Cool J, but he's also a selfish player. Yeah, but I mean, does Shark 
did he actually talk shit about the defense or did L was he just talking about shit about L cool and then L cool J got shark on his side? No, he said the defense is giving up points. He, I mean, so LL Cool J is definitely like a little bitch who's just trying to like you know get him in trouble with with Shark. But I mean, he did say those things. They weren't like made up. Dude, Shark sawing electrical sawing his car in half. That was awesome. Yeah, I mean, I you should you're not going to do this, but if you go watch like old lawrence taylor football clips because that's who plays shark um yeah he's fucking a mean motherfucker back in the day i think he yeah he's the one that ended he ended joe theisman's career he like hit him broke he broke his leg so bad that he got up and immediately lawrence taylor started calling to the sideline for the megs to come out (laughs) like and he was the defender he's like i've i might have killed this man (laughs) yes but did he ever pop an eyeball out onto the field? Yeah, that was uh, that was something. That's one of those things that sticks with you. That's like probably why I have like a like an eyeball thing where I don't like that. Uh, you know, same in Kill Bill too. Although that oh, yeah. bitch deserved it. You know what I mean? That's true too, and the other eye. Um. So, okay, so. Ca- he makes a yeah. He makes a dick of himself. Invisible juice, and then they lose. They're they're playing the the game in the rain. Yeah, this is kind of an interesting part where his team is basically letting him get his ass kicked. Like the line is letting guys through to like destroy him. And you know, at one point, Tony, the coach, is like, "Yeah, I mean, I guess he'll learn a lesson." But it's like, are you you really gonna let that happen? Are you not gonna go to your guys and be like, "What the fuck are you doing?" And I then didn't if- get confused because I was like, okay, I don't know how football works, dude, obviously. Mm-hmm. But with Cap, before the start of this movie, they already lost three in a row. So yeah. so they had only four games left, but then they lost the other two. So they only have two games to... How many games do you need to win to make the playoffs? Uh, just I mean, kind of just need a, a winning record, really. So they were... When they lost their fourth in a row, the first game that we see the uh, the first game we see in the movie, they were seven and six because Tony writes that down. I think then they win the next two, so they're nine and six. And then uh, the next one is I think their last one because I think they're doing a sixteen game season. Yeah, and they had a bye week. And so if they win that, they get first a first round bye or they get home field advantage, which doesn't make sense. Ten and six usually doesn't get you that. So, um, but they end the regular season nine and seven, which is good enough to make it to the playoffs, but not the f- number one seed according to this movie. Um, ah, uh, okay. So yeah, and then uh, Tony comes in. He's like, "You've embarrassed yourself. I'm ashamed to be your coach." And they're all like, "Oh, yeah." Then Modine comes in, Matthew Modine, and tells Coach Shark that you broke your neck and never healed right, and you're gonna you're gonna die. And he's like, but I need my bonus. And the line of like, I gave you 13 years. You can give me one. Which does means it one does game. it really count down to their bonus being like, he said something about like one tackle and two defense blocks or something like that. Is that really like he has to hit those quotas for his bonus? Yeah, it just depends on the contract. Uh, but yeah, a lot of football players have that shit. Like some of them will have like, oh, like quarterbacks can sometimes have like, oh, if you want a playoff game. You win the Super Bowl, you get like this amount of money. Just like, yeah, incentives to for them to. I do like better. that. I don't. I, we're not there yet. I don't think, but I do like that little kid going up to Ella Cool J, being like, "Is it true that you make ten million dollars a year?" He's it's like, so true. "Yeah." You don't block. You don't block anymore. <laughs> you don't block anymore. Yeah, that's what my daddy says. <laughs> yeah, there's this like famous clip too of a. Uh, you know who Rob Gronkowski is, right? Nope. Yeah, you do. You worked with him. What? You told me you worked with him on a movie. You're like, oh, oh yeah, Gronk, yeah. Gronk, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, where like it was like the last game of the season, and he like someone comes up to him, he's like, yeah, you need eight more yards, and he goes up to Tom, and he's like, I need eight more yards, and then they go out the next play, and Tom's like, I got you, and throws him a pass, so he get he got like five hundred thousand dollars because it comes down to these like last games where it's like you catch in one more ball and you get yeah five hundred thousand, and then you. Yeah, you'll, have, you'll have like teams too who will track that shit and then be like, all right, don't play this person because then we can save a million dollars. 
Interesting. Yeah, working working on a movie with Gronk was funny because first of all, I don't know if it was his wife or his girlfriend or whoever he had with him. But she girlfriend. was like, yeah, she was with she who she was. And then he played like this really nothing character. He was just like, it's a nothing character. It's like the the bodyguard or the hitman of like the mob boss or some shit like that. And he had no lines and he just had to move like around a car with a gun, get shot and then die. And I was just like, I don't know who this guy is, but he's the worst fucking actor I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, that makes sense. So um, they then go down and fire James Woods and great scene. Great. This is when he gets the shine too. And he's like, you know, what I'm going to tell him. No, I mean, he's right though. Right. Like one, you have to tell them, but when he says, I know what the answer is going to be. I mean, we just got the answer five seconds before where he's like, you have to let me play and get this bonus. So, I mean, like it is the same result, but you just can't do what you did. But I love when he then says to the woman, he's like, come on, Charlene or whatever. And she's like, uh, no, I'm going to stay here. And he's like, fine, stay here and get butt fucked by 12 Neanderthals. Yeah. Such a fucking funny line. Yeah. Yeah, he says a similar one in Hercules to to Meg. So, you know. No, it's a, yeah, yeah. Similar. Anyway. Similar. Um, and then there's this. This is sort of the point where it's like the the reformation of Willie Beeman. So he goes into the sauna. Shark is there. And he gives him this whole speech and it was like, you lead, but did anyone follow? And, you know, and then he just is like, you need to fucking get your shit right. Yeah. And, and then, and then, the, uh, the Tony, speech. huh? Say Tony's, it again. Tony's speech. Tony's speech is later on. Yeah. But that comes like full circle with his character arc. Uh, Willie's character arc. Cause you see him, you see him like take it in a certain way. And walk closer and like, yeah, really listen. Yeah. And I agree. Well, at this point, he goes to Cap and he tells him he's going to start. And Cap is like, why don't maybe maybe Willie should start. And then the wife slaps in. Yeah, sh- just like a money grubbing asshole. That wife is in Cap, scene. Cap's wife. Yeah. Yeah, dude. Lauren Holly. But she's probably really nice in real life. Just not her character. Um then uh, the really kind of when you realize that Willie is sort of becoming like kind of the old Willie, like becoming a better person is when he sees his ex-girlfriend and he follows her into the bathroom. That's when you know, like, all right, this is he's going to be all right. Barbara Bush. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I like how he wins her over, too. He's like, oh, what, did, what, did, what did she say? He goes, he goes, what about that? That uh, that prehistoric guy you're with and he she's like you're just jealous because he's tall and he goes but can he play ball mm-hmm. yeah well, you just rhymed right there that was pretty good um so then the next scene cameron diaz comes in and she's like you gotta start willie and he's like i'm starting cap not only that i'm trading willie next season which is she gets so mad about but it's like you're firing him already like yeah. you're not bringing him back yeah and then he goes over to talk to the wife to the mom and, she, and Cameron Diaz comes over and she overhears this conversation. And the mom's like, I fucking hated you. I hated football. I hated all this shit because it stole my husband and now it's stealing my daughter. And it's like, woman, you're an alcoholic. Like, Dude. that's that's why you don't see you. Like, I really thought I thought we were going to get a scene with her. Like fucking somebody. The mom? Yeah. Probably number sixty nine. I thought it might have been Tony, but he kept yeah. going for that prostitute, so I don't know. Well, until until he asked her out. Oh, dude, we skipped over the scene where he like is like, hey, I want to make this a, a real thing, and she's like, You don't want that. You don't. You don't want that. But also, right before that, they're basically having a tickle fight in bed. Yeah, yeah. It's like that's you want to talk about cringe. Oh, no, no, no. I agree. I agree. But, you know, Tony and the mom had some history. Like, they were dancing up on the steps at the kind of beginning of the movie. And it wasn't like um, the Ben-Hur guy. What's his name? I keep Charlton Heston. Charlton. Charlton Heston. Didn't he, he tell Cameron Diaz, like, damn, your mom, your mom's looking good. I was like, mm-hmm. just, does he want to, like. I don't think like, he said it like that. I think she's like, oh, she's looking good. Not like. Nah, he, want, he wanted to bone Cameron Diaz's mom but the thing is though is that like 
just if he wanted to do that would the would the move to LA would that made a move that to LA easier? Just gave up her mom? <laughs> no, I don't know what you're saying. But no. <laughs> um so let's get to the pregame. We got Bill Bellamy on the best wide receiver that's ever lived. Um I love Tony. We didn't even talk about this, but uh, Al Pacino threw John C. McGinley down some bleachers. So he has to do the public apology, and That's he's monotone, right. monotone reading the speech, like no emotion, whatever. Then I know what him. kind of invaluable. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> walks by him and is like, hey, where's your wheelchair? Basically, hey, you weren't fucking hurt. And like, you made this all about you. Like, you made yourself a story. Um, and then there's this interesting part too with Matthew Modine where he's like looking over Shark and he's like, all right, you can play. And he's like, hey man, what about another shot? And he's like, well, medically, you know, there's no reason to give you it. And he's like, yeah, I'm not talking about medically. I'm like, I want that shit. And you see him holding the syringe. And what's funny, a little bit later, you see him chatting up this like hot blonde lady. And it's like, that's the same shit James Woods was doing, right? Giving people shots they didn't need and chatting up the hotties on the sideline. And it's like, Kind of this this world corrupts everybody is you know like kind of the point of that. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, I didn't look at it that way, but but yeah, no, it's good. So we get to the speech. This is not just one of the greatest speeches in a sports movie. It's one of the greatest monologues in movie history, and I love the music. Yeah, I love everything about it. Thanks to Jamie Fox, because of how how important he thought it was. You, you didn't hear the story. Jamie Foxx told a story about how he... Uh, so apparently Al Pacino was giving the speech and it wasn't working right. Like no one was really feeling it. Did you hear the story? I don't want to repeat it if you have. Well, you can just say it to the, the few people that are listening. So apparently either Oliver Stone didn't like it or Al Pacino wasn't feeling it. Like no one, no one on the team really felt truly inspired by it. And they don't know what was missing because Al Pacino is such a good actor. So Jamie Foxx went up to Pacino and goes, look, to uh, to a lot of people on a football team, the coach is the only father figure that they've ever had. So instead of going about it like you're their boss, say it like a father would be telling this to their son. And that's what you get in the movie. And that's what makes it into the movie. And that's what uh, Fox tells Pacino. And he's like, so I was right when you, like, your daddy wasn't there and, like, you were living in the hood. He's like, yeah, you were, but I didn't want to say that. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was interesting. Like, that was from the perspective of Jamie Foxx. Yeah. Well, I got some info about that because he played, he played a little football, like, at least in high school. So, um, you know, the add up those inches between winning and losing, living and dying. It's all, like... The way the team gets up and starts screaming their heads off, I was like, I'd fucking run through a wall like for that speech. Um, and then the opening kickoff, the opposing team takes it in for a touchdown. It's like the things didn't start that great. Um, but then they like, I love the first half montage with Cap. They use the Use Me song by Bill Withers. And I think yeah. it's so good that it's interesting. The music goes from like, you know, you kind of have some like, some rap, like some old school, like R and B to like some, like the revolution song is like almost borderline, I guess gospel, right? Cause I forget who it is. It's um, POD. POD. You thought that was POD. It was. I don't think it was revolution. No, no, no. The, like the oh, POD is a, a uh, Christian band, right? Yeah. Cause they're not gospel. No, but they're, they're on the album for this this uh this movie which one which song i don't oh, remember it in the movie i don't, I don't know but it's a christian Kirk band. franklin i think is does revolution thanks for thanks for vamping enough for me to get to what you're welcome and by the <laughs> way didn't look that up that was just in the that was in the, i could be wrong still who knows yeah it's possible yeah. um i'm um, one thing i noticed is that you'll go from like rap and r&b to like 80s rock music without any transition just one after the other yeah well i think the movie the music the cutting it's all to make this sort of a jarring experience as if you're getting like your head caved in on the field it felt like it buddy yeah 
So uh, we then get to halftime after uh, Dennis Quaid runs in for a TD and he's basically like, I'm fucking, I'm done. Well, hold on. okay, so something just occurred to me. Remember that scene in the locker rooms back at like beginning of the movie where like all the black pay- players were on the one side listening to their R&B on their boom box, but then all the like the white rock players were listening to their music on their boom uh-huh. box. That's what the whole fucking movie felt like was a battle between two different genres of music back and forth. There was one black player that was listening to the rock too, though. So let's not, you know. I, yeah, but he was, yeah, but and he was I, what, Alon? Bald. He was bald. Okay, but it was oh, it's kind of weird because the yes, I know he was black, but the, it was weird because the one guy came over and goes, "Stop with your Nazi shit or your skinhead shit," and I'm like, "Can't say that." He did. Yeah. So uh, at halftime, he decides to go with Willie, and Cameron Diaz comes down and starts yelling. And he like starts throwing shit. And he's like, "Do not come into my locker room." And fucking Jamie Fox just comes in. And is like, "Hey man, like we don't even need to do this. He already told me I'm starting. Like, what are you guys arguing about?" I no, that was confusing to me. So did she want him to start? She didn't want him to start. She wanted him to start. Al Pacino didn't want to be told what to do because he's like, I, "This is my team. I control this. Get the fuck out of here. Hmm. You don't even know anything about football, all right?" I love the next scene as they're walking down the hall, like to the to the like to the field and uh he just keeps saying stuff to willie and jamie fox is response like yep 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 like it's always like i can't take all this like i can't retain everything you're throwing at me um so this is when the eyeball scene happens and there's this like fucking oliver stone's doing this like illuminati thing where he's like panning to all the eyes inside the triangles like around the stadium you know, like the, the the this is what the Dallas Knights and like the the imagery for this team is like super like I don't know Illuminati mysticism like secret society is what it feels like um, and it also but then it's like the red and yellow it's the color of like the medieval times and it's the knights uh, so it gets down to it where basically they need one score to win and. This is really like well done where Willie throws the game winning touchdown. You think they've won. There's no indication. And then you look and there's a flag on the play and they have to basically do it all over again. What I my only gripe with the scoring in this movie, and maybe that's just how football works, is that every every fucking game, it's the Sharks down by some amount of points and it's them working their way up as the other team is always 10 points, five points, three points ahead until like the very last play. And then they overtake them. Right. And then they win, but, Mm -hmm. or, or they lose, you know, but it's never like a back and forth where like, Oh, the sharks up are up by five. Oh, but then the other team gets a, a touchdown. So now they're down by one or, you know, it's, so it's like, it's always them trying to gain. It's never like a back and forth. Is that how just usually football games go? It goes a bunch of different ways. I mean, this one does have... So the first game, they're actually winning. <clears throat> I think they're winning at the end, and L O Cool J fumbles it, and so they lose. So they're up three, and then he fumbles it, and then they lose the game. The game where Willie's getting this shit kicked out of him because the line's not blocking, I think they lost like 30-something to zero. Um, and then, yeah, the other games, they were down and had to come back, I think. I don't know if the L.A. game, if they're just winning the whole time, because that's like the game where... Willie like balls out, but uh, yeah, I mean this it can happen any any which yeah. way. Okay, all right, and then he, you know, we totally missed the part where he just throws up every fifteen minutes. Every game, yeah, it's his it's his ritual. There's this also weird Oliver Stone editing thing where he shows a conversation between Cameron Diaz and her mom. Yeah, as Inter- the intercut. as the clock is like counting down in the game, and there's like thirty seconds left, and it's counting down. Like as a play is happening, we don't even see it. But this is sort of like her arc of like, yeah, I realize I've been kind of an asshole lately. And the mom's like, it's all right. It's fine. It, all, it happens. Yeah, I guess we needed that. I don't know. And then there's this one part, something I've been dying to ask. Did you not like my jambalaya? He's like, why do you think I've been throwing up every week? I thought that was good. I, I thought that was good. Good rapport. They go back in. He wins the game. I love the final play where he like, because he... He uh, basically, I think it's another boot. He sets, 
and he's like visualizes the play happening of him running and right before that cap was like visualize it then do it so he visualizes him running for a touchdown and then the way he just dives over the line as the guys hits him and then when the ref that comes in and calls it a touchdown was the one that the lineman had pushed earlier so good on him for not letting that affect his judgment he calls a touchdown for the sharks yeah that that's true too um and then this movie has like three different endings so it's after they win the game, and then it's after the game, where once again they say the name of the movie again, and he's like, Al Pacino's like, yeah, I don't think I'm going to be here next year. And, and Beeman thinks it's almost because of him, right? He's like, yeah, I kind of figured you were going to leave. Um, So that happens, and then he has this thing. He's like, listen, the thing you are going to miss is not like the championships, it's the guys. Like if you're a leader, it's the guys looking back at you know looking at you as their leader yep um and then i do love the ending of this where what it's kind of funny because you think it's a sweet ending cameron diaz looks at him and is like thank you for teaching me what like what this should all be about and he's like no problem baby by the way i'm gonna be coaching in albuquerque next year and i'm taking willie beeman it's such a funny ending. the the ending kind of saved the whole movie for me honestly like the reveal where he's taking willie is like and everyone's just looking at him i love the guy who's like you son of a bitch like everyone's pissed and then but except for mcginley like mcginley yeah mcginley he he, they look at each other he's like you're smoking cigars on my dime now pal you know Uh uh-huh yeah no i agree this is good shit yeah um so I think we're into fun fact territory here. Sure. So I guess the studio originally wanted Clint Eastwood for the Al Pacino part. And then it was also offered to Robert De Niro. He turned it down. Robert De Niro would have been good. I think this is one of my favorite like Al Pacino performances. This is a really good one for Al Pacino because it's also not like you don't expect Al Pacino to be this, you know. I could see Clint Eastwood. I cannot see Robert De Niro doing this. I don't know. I think any Al Pacino part I could see De Niro doing and vice versa. Um, Cuba Gooding nah. Jr. went out Dude, for the I, Jamie. I would love to see uh, Meet the Fockers with Al Pacino. Yeah, I think it would have been great. I think it honestly, it's like the Meet the Fockers is more of a stretch for De Niro, the comedy. I agree with you. Which yeah. I think Al Pacino can just do. I mean, Al Pacino think- was in Jack and Jill. So, yeah, there you go. Cuba Gooding Jr. went out for this part, but he didn't get it because he didn't. Uh, Oliver Stone didn't, you know, so quickly after Jerry Maguire didn't want to make him a football player. And then um, Chris Tucker, it says Chris Tucker turned down the Jamie Foxx role. I find that very hard. You find to it hard to believe that he turned it down, right? <clears throat> I find it hard to believe that he was offered it. Like I don't know, but the thing is. Jamie Foxx at this time is not a sure thing for this part. But then after the fact, you're like, oh, no, he's perfect for that part. Yeah. But, yeah, Chris Tucker, I don't think when he's did... done anything like this. He hasn't done anything that like like Jamie Foxx has done. When did Fifth Element? When did the Fifth Element come out? Um, I mean, around the same time. But I mean, 90, not... 97, yeah. So Ed Burns was originally cast as Nick Crozier. The Aaron Eckhart part. Dude, Ed Burns would have killed. He would have. I mean, you can't have... I mean, it's sort of a nothing part. This is like maybe the first thing I ever saw Aaron Eckhart in. Probably for sure. Um, And then the last thing, I find this... Well, Tom Sizemore had a role in the film, but was cut. Ving Rhames and David Duchovny both turned down roles. Don't know what those were. Ving Rhames uh-huh. probably turned down Shark... The sh- no, he probably because I was thinking, um, who's the who's the black guy who was working with uh, Pacino, um, Jim Brown. Jim Brown, I thought I was thinking, man, Ving Rhames could play this part. Yeah, Jim Brown's like an actual football player, but yeah, I um, that that's the one that makes sense. Duchovny makes sense as the Crozier part as the Aaron Eckhart role. Yeah. Or yeah. the Matthew Modine role. Or the Matthew Modine role, I guess. But at that time, I think probably needed something bigger. 
So this part I find hilarious, and it's especially resonant because of the news about this individual right now. I'm just going to read. Sean Puffy P. Diddy Combs was initially cast as Willie Beeman, but scheduling conflicts supposedly caused him to drop out. However, other sources cite that when football experts began working with Combs, they realized he had zero throwing ability. And they knew he could never play the role as a convincing quarterback. Uh, whereas Fox is a good athlete and played high school football. He also had a scheduling conflict where he was a pedophile. So I also feel like Sean Combs is not talented in any way. And I don't know that he... Although, he, I guess he did that Monsters Ball movie. But he's just playing a guy on death row. I don't know how much screen time he gets in that. But I think that would have been terrible. And I don't... Like, the Jamie Foxx role doesn't feel that hard because he makes it so seamless. Yeah. But Jamie Foxx is like one of the most talented people on earth as far as like the arts. I never thought that. I never thought that. And then after a few interviews and me really getting to like know some of his roles, I'm like, he's like, he doesn't show it on his sleeve that much, but he is full of talent. First of all, he started out doing stand up comedy where he's hilarious. Yeah. He can sing. Yeah. He does amazing impressions, including maybe the best Trump impression you've ever heard. You should look that up. I did. I have. I've seen it. His acting in comedic roles is amazing. Action and roles. Dramatic roles and his action roles. Like, that's five tools right there. I think I just named. It's five Man. tool player. Five tool player. Uh, this movie was like, it felt like, like a warm blanket putting it back on. I hadn't seen it in years. Oh. But it was just like that's good for you. It was it was nice watching it again. It's yeah. it's so entertaining. It it felt like an electric blanket that kept short circuiting on my body consistently as I was watching this. I think your problem was like there's just too much football in this football movie for you. Yeah, and that that might be things. true. Too many cuts. Too loud. Too many I cuts. Felt like- <laughs> That's the su- that's the subtitle of the movie. Any given Sunday. Too many cuts, too many dicks. <laughs> too many cuts, too many dicks. That's my review. Three out of five stars. Well, thanks for listening to another episode of I Finally Watched. This is David. And this is Alon. And I finally watched Any Given Sunday.